morning uh, with the usual announcement that uh, please uh, remember uh, whatever you say is being recorded um, also during the Q&A or uh, I believe also in the chat I'm not quite sure um, possibly not uh, but since we read aloud the uh, questions in the chat for uh, to anyone's advantage um, just remember uh, so thanks uh, once again to uh, Emmy, who has uh, very kindly volunteered to <laughs> support us uh, in this uh, uh, challenging uh, enterprise of delivering the whole course online. Um, it would have been a little bit more challenging uh, without COVID, uh, but uh, thanks to COVID, we kind of, kind of used to this. Uh, but I was really hoping not to have to do this anymore. Um, but anyway, here we are. So. Um, let me share the slides so we can start from where we left yesterday. So at this point, you should see the old cover of uh, a very famous, uh, certainly very famous for philosophers, one of the most famous uh, scientific journals in uh, in philosophy. Uh, it's called Mind. Um, and at the time, if you look uh, up, it was uh, uh, edited uh, by uh, no one else than Gilbert Ryle, uh, who was, uh, of course, a, uh, a fellow of modern college here in Oxford. Um, and uh, uh, it published papers such as uh, the uh, computing machinery and intelligence. Um, now, actually, if you look around, uh, and I'll stop here, and you look at all the, uh, the other people who are publishing in this issue, those were the days when you would have in the same issue uh, Warnock, Broad, Rees, uh, Geech. Um, these are names that have made the history of philosophy, certainly um, uh, very significant in uh, British philosophy, but also in philosophy uh, to core uh, in the uh, 20th century. Um, I remind people who haven't had that experience that those were the days where, uh, and I grew up uh, in that particular context, where you actually waited for uh, a quarterly uh, issue of Mind, and then you would pick up about maybe five or six uh, journals like Mind in your area, and you would be, you know, thanks to that, reading updated in terms of uh, where the research was happening, who was doing what. Clearly, those years are <laughs> way past. Um, uh, we're talking. Uh, uh, about 70, uh, 80 years ago, if you look at top right, is uh, October 1950. Uh, yesterday, uh, we started the lecture discussing the rhetoric behind an ongoing uh, um, campaign, it seems to me, of disinformation. Uh, the campaign, uh, whether willfully uh, or inadvertently, uh, seeks to convince the public uh, and the, um, uh, the politicians, the lawmakers, that AI represents an existential risk as dangerous, or according to some people, uh, even more dangerous than uh, a nuclear war and the extinction of any biological life on this planet because of uh, climate change. I'm not exaggerating, this is exactly what you read around, and uh, I hope that the exaggeration uh, casts uh, sufficient doubts on the quality and value of the message, the campaign. I give you a quick sort of, uh, and I hope, uh, uh, sufficiently uh, entertaining uh, to some extent, insofar as a lecture by a philosopher can be entertaining at all, uh, walk through uh, some of the um, rhetorical devices, uh, I listed 10, um, use, as I said, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes uh, willfully, um, by people who are really or pretend to be worried about AI coming and dominating the world, destroying humanity, uh, coming to finish uh, once and for all civilizations uh, on this planet. All that started from this paper um, uh, in terms of science. Um, is uh, Turing uh, asking uh, a very famous question uh, and I also show you yesterday uh, the next slide, but let's step back and uh, 
as I told you uh, yesterday, uh, this is a uh, longish paper, uh, and uh, um, there is a, a risk that people may not read the whole paper. I invite you to do so. Uh, it's uh, one of the classics. It's uh, freely available online. Uh, um, on page 433, at the very beginning, if you look at the uh, right hand side, uh, first page of the article, um, uh, Turing asks a super classic question Can machines think? Much, much later, uh, on about well, 10 pages later, um, uh, which in a printed uh, version is quite a lot uh, later, he writes that uh, the question uh, is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Now, this, uh, which, you know, what well, you find the text in front of you is, is the actual quotation. Uh, the three dots uh, there uh, indicate the distance between the first quote and the second is normally uh, something that people forget. Um, and so even these days, uh, we have uh, scientists um, or uh, mass media uh, and, and journalist people discussing, oh, is a, uh, a computer able to think? Well, can machine thinks is meaningless. Uh, and as Turing says, it's meaningless for a fundamental reason. We really do not have uh, an in his view, and I agree with uh, him, would, would not have a definition of machine and thinking. When I say a definition, I'm following Turing in talking seriously. A definition uh, indicates the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be what it is. So a triangle, the definition of a triangle is a figure of the plane with three sides and three angles. So that if you have one, you have the other and vice versa. Bachelor is defined as you no know, a, a unmarried man. So if you have an unmarried man, that is a bachelor. And if you have a bachelor, you have an unmarried man. Necessary and sufficient. Now, Turing, uh, rightly so, this is a great scientist, says, well, you know, uh, we don't have that. And therefore, we cannot even address that question seriously. What we can do, and I'll tell you more in a moment, is to run a test. Now, the test, uh, which will become uh, known as uh, the Turing test. Of course, Turing doesn't um, call it that way. He calls it an imitation test. Um, is also something that much, much later, uh, the Leibner, um, uh, Mr. Leibner of the uh, no, surname, um, decided to um, uh, implement as a prize. And uh, I can't remember uh, now if it is run, still run every year. Um, but at some point, it was run every year in the States. The first time that it came to the UK uh, as a competition to see whether anyone, and I'll tell you more about this test in a moment, could uh, develop a piece of software of any kind that could pass the Turing test. I haven't told you what the Turing test is. Most of you should probably know, but I'll tell you uh, in details uh, in the next slide. Well, um, they would win the Leibniz Prize, uh, many, several uh, thousand dollars, and a medal, etc. The medal, uh, as you can tell, it's a bit ironic. Well, poor Turing, he said it was meaningless. And uh, there is uh, his profile and the question. So, um, so much for not reading the whole paper. Um, now, the Lebanon Prize, uh, as I said, uh, has been uh, run in the United States, um, but at some point, for the first time, it came to the UK. It was run uh, by the University of Reading, and I was asked to be one of the judges. Uh, Something really funny happened at the time. I'll tell you more in a moment, because at first I want to tell you what the test is. It's a test to see whether a machine, call it a computer, can be indistinguishable from a human being, another agent. So a human agent and an artificial agent. Uh, imagine this bee being a uh, human being uh, and a uh, human uh, uh, agent and A is your artificial agent. Now you or us are in a separate room or, or it could be on the other side of the moon as far as we know, but we cannot meet or see the two agents. We can only ask questions. You can uh, ask questions for uh, about five minutes and if 70% of the time, no, say three out of four more or less um, of the questions, you cannot tell who is who then 
the machine has passed the test. In other words, has shown to be indistinguishable in terms of performance and a particular performance, not any performance, not dancing, no, no, no singing, no shaking hands, uh, not being nice to you, but in answering questions, um, it's indistinguishable from a human being. Now, it doesn't mean that it's better. It doesn't mean that, for example, ans answer questions more precisely. You just can't tell whether the question comes from A or B. Imagine, now we are back at the University of Reading a few years ago. And uh, I'm sitting there, uh, I'm C here, and I'm actually joined by a BBC journalist. Um, so all this, uh, I think if you Google enough, you can probably find somewhere because the BBC journalist actually, she wrote an article on this. Um, and um, the journalist uh, starts telling me that she really knows what needs to be asked in order to discriminate, to be able to tell who is who. I said, look, no, uh, Professor Freud, if, uh, I have the right questions. I can ask the questions and be able to tell whether the answer comes from a computer or a human being. Well, this is all real life. Um, uh, we are in a real room. We are, of course, typing on this terminal. In the other room, there are the other uh, agents, etc. We are randomly allocated judges and players, etc. And so um, I naively think that if anyone knows how to ask questions, that must be a journalist. And so she asked the first question. And the first question is, do you like ice cream? I cannot stress enough how stupid that question is. Because whatever the answer is, whatever, you will never know who gave you the answer. If you have a, a mechanism that is tossing a coin on the other side, yes or no, and you get a yes, you will not be able to tell the difference between a human being and a tossing coin mechanism. Any question that is a yes, no question is by default, by nature, intrinsically unable to discriminate the nature of the source of the answer. It would be like saying, do you like Paris or not? Have you ever been to Bologna or not? Do you eat pizza or not? If it is a yes or no question, by default, that question is incapable, is the wrong tool. Now, I don't want to stay here for too long because the story gets even worse. But if you don't get this point, please ask a question afterwards because it's crucial. If you do not understand that a yes, no question, we will never, by definition, enable you to discriminate who is who in terms of you know, what the answer you're going to get, there's something wrong. It means that I haven't explained it well enough. Of course, what we got on the screen, I can't remember, was yes, no, 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 yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. Whatever combination of uh, yes or no on the other side, the journalists started getting worried. I say, I can't tell who is who by the answers. And I was going to launch myself into a whole lecture about logic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when no, she stopped me. I said, like, look, no, I'm, don't worry. I'll, I have the next question, and um, uh, the next question is going to be uh, no, a real killer. Uh, I have a silver bullet. And me, naive and maybe too much of a gentleman, I said, well, of course, no, by all means, try again. So, and the next question, you will not believe it, but I think there is a record somewhere. Uh, next question is, do you believe in God? Another yes, no question. Of course, we get another yes, no independently. And the journalist starts shouting like, we have machines passing the Turing test. Artificial intelligence arrived. Like, and I no, grab a hair, no, arm and say, look, maybe we need to ask different kind of questions. Questions that require understanding of what the meaning of the question is, not yes, no, which can be passed or not passed independently by a tossing coin kind of mechanism. And so one of the questions I go by memory, but was like, uh, um, you have a pair of shoes, what can you do with that? And of course, one was like wearing them or something, and you're like, oh, I can stop a door, I can nail something on the wall, uh, there could be a little ship for no, no, plastic soldiers. And, no, it was immediately clear who was the human being and who, which the computer. Then we asked one more question. Remember, you have five minutes, 70 percent. And the next question was um, the uh, the capitals of the UK are uh, three, Liverpool and Manchester. What's wrong with that sentence? And of course, the 
guy or whoever was that the person, the, the woman or man behind her, uh, the, the human agent said, look, this is nonsensical. First you say three, then you mention two, and neither of them is the capital of the UK. It's London. So, oh, okay, say that. The other one said, I'm not an encyclopedia. Okay, <laughs> I think I'm going to get uh, right this. And another question like that, and oh, it was the other one was like, um, um, the car couldn't park uh, in uh, in the car uh, in the car park. Which one was too small? Um, and again, and the guy's like, well, of course, the, the space for the car. The no, poor software said, and I'm not encyclopedia, etc. So it became obvious that uh, it was perfectly possible at the time, and there's a, a, uh, an upgrade now in terms of Turing test to show that the Turing test was not passed. The Turing test. Uh, the logic behind it is the following. So please um, uh, pay a bit of attention. It's not to get a correct, good, intelligent answer. It's to make sure that you can, by asking a special kind of question, you can tell who is giving you the answer. So you need to be a little bit intelligent in doing that. No. Uh, so yes, no questions will not work. Semantic questions at the time did work they no longer work today. If you have ChatGPT on the other side, and as I have tried, for example, I asked ChatGPT, no, the, the three capitals of the UK are Manchester and Liverpool, what's wrong with that? It will tell you exactly what's wrong with that sense. It said, no, three, you mentioned two, two, neither, London, no, thank you, what's wrong with you? Now, of course, you need to be careful because ChatGPT will also add, no, um, I'm just an agent, et cetera, et cetera. But you can tell that uh, ChatGPT would pass that kind of uh, questioning because it's you know, super powerful in terms of handling language. So recently someone reminded me about this um, and I'll tell you more uh, in a couple of slides. I said, oh, Professor Floyd, so what about now? Now, ChatGPT has passed the Turing test. I said, no, of course not. Remember what we are doing here. 70% of the time, five minutes, you ask any question you want to spot the difference. And so all you need to do now is to ask one semantic, in case it's an old piece of junk from uh, the 80s, and the next question is, which I did, please, can you tell me how many people die in which tragedies by Shakespeare order from Z to A, or in terms of number of death? And of course, ChatGPT just start writing, and it tells you seven, five, three, two. What actually? I discovered that in one tragedy, I've forgotten which one, but please test. It's quite unclear how many people die because one is not quite real. They pull out the machine, like what? <laughs> Have they no idea? So, oh, bingo! Guess who is the computer and who is the ChatGPT and who is the human being? So now the questions are not semantic oriented; they are in terms of way too good to be true. So you can actually ask him, look, can you please list all the names uh, that occur in the Bible alphabetically starting from Z? Chat GPT starts writing. The poor no, human agent says, hello, <laughs> are you insane? So I can't do this. So uh, the, all I want to show here is the importance of understanding the question and answer game. That was not during a test. So in the same way as you don't have a definition of a, a good driver, but you test a driver by having you know, a driving test, likewise, you know, Turing had the same uh, kind of um, uh, approach. Once we do this, what is the mechanism at stake? Remember, we are C here, and A and B uh, are uh, to be discriminated, as in you know, the epistemological sense, uh, not the moral sense. We want to discriminate between who is who, we want to be able to distinguish. The process through which A and B deliver to us the, uh, the answer, it, it's uh, the same. So they both send an email, for example. So we can't use that. We need to be able to uh, devise uh, questions that are able to reverse from the answer the nature of the source. A lot of the questions become these days irreversible. All days when the uh, Leibniz Prize was uh, reading, the semantic questions were reversible, meaning you could go from the output, what answer you received, to the 
source which agent had delivered that no, reverse backwards. What the journalists didn't understand was this simple distinction between reversible and irreversible uh, processes, no, the no, Q&A, et cetera. Let me give you um, a typical, uh, this is something that you study in mathematical logic uh, in the first year. Uh, mathematical logic is also what is behind uh, the so-called logic gates, for example, uh, which are at the very, very bottom of anything we do, uh, with whatever computer we are using, uh, the AND, OR, etc. In the logic gate context, or in a sort of uh, simplified uh, context of Q&A, reversible and irreversible questions are the sort of questions that enable you from the output to be able to tell me what the process is and therefore the input. Now imagine that you walk into the room where uh, Emmy is and you find on that blackboard uh, behind her four, just written, just four. And imagine I give you uh, uh, we might even have uh, no, an, an interaction over there. Uh, so, so you got four, perfect. Uh, and the input is, yeah, you have two and two uh, as an input. Can you tell me what process, mathematically speaking, in terms of mathematical operation, one of the four led to four? Well, that could be an adding two and two or a multiplication. You can't tell. So from knowing the input in this case to knowing the output, so the output is four, the input is twice two, you cannot reconstruct what the process was. Was it a matter of adding two and two or was it a matter of multiplying two by two? Can't tell, irreversible. That's where all this discussion comes from. Of course, in this case, is the you know, known reversibility of, given the input and the output, the process. In the case of the Q&A and the Turing test is the irreversibility of the process given the output in terms of who was the source. But the logic is the same. There are certain kind of conditions such that you can go back to what you want or not. Another simple example, and I stop here. You come to my house, I've used this a million times, and you find clean dishes on the table. The question is, who did the dishes? Luciano by hand or the dishwasher? That question is irreversible. You can't tell. There's no way uh, you can actually uh, go back to who did the dishes, how, by looking at the clean dishes. Now, this is also a limit of the Turing test. And let me uh, say this more, one more thing, and then we move on. Suppose that the Turing test is passed one day. Not only we have um, uh, now semantically uh, irreversible questions, meaning ChatGPT is so good that it works like a, a dishwasher example. It cleans the dishes so well that you can't tell whether it was me or the dishwasher. ChatGPT answers semantic child questions, questions that uh, are based on relevance, understanding, etc. so well not because he understands anything, but you know, the syntax, the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, the data are so powerful that you cannot reverse back to, by asking specific semantic questions, um, reverse back to who is who. Suppose that all questions of any kind, even uh, no, with a bit of cheating, imagine a chat GPT that is uh, carefully uh, programmed to make sure that if you ask questions that require too much to much information, they're too precise, too knowledgeable, starts pretending to behave like a human being. So when I ask about the Shakespeare tragedies or the names in the Bible or you, whatever you want, um, ChatGPT says, well, no, I'm not quite sure, etc. So uh, some chi. So imagine that all the possible questions we will ever ask coming from C, they all become irreversible. In other words, no matter what we ask, no 70%, but 100 times out of 100 times, no, always, five minutes or 15 minutes, we will never be able to tell who is who. In other words, imagine for a moment that the Turing test no, has been passed. What does it prove? Dramatic pose. Remember the analogy with the driver? 
how many people you know around who have a driving license and should not be on the road, okay? <laughs> Passing a test is, doesn't prove that you are what the test says you are, but it proves that you are not unable to pass the test. So um, back to the driving license. Suppose that uh, you pass the driving license uh, uh, test, uh, you drive, etc. Here it is. Here's your driving license. Does it mean that you're a good driver? No. It means that if you had not passed the driving test, you would have been a bad driver. Now, the double negative counterfactual is essential because otherwise you don't get no, what is on the other side. If something doesn't pass the test, it's below the threshold. It means that not passing the test is sufficient to be disqualified. Passing the test is necessary to be qualified, but it's not sufficient to be a qualified agent of that kind. I hope the driving test uh, is good enough, um, but imagine uh, a simple test for foreign language. Uh, uh, you, you, you're, you're learning a language. I, I, I have no idea how to speak Turkish, for example. Um, the sounds is amazing. I've been to Istanbul a few times. I wish I could. Unfortunately, I cannot. So to me, Turkish, it really is a completely 100% foreign language. Imagine I learn a little bit of uh, colloquial uh, Turkish, a uh, no, couple of months, and I can get by with a few questions. Now, imagine that the test is super simple, a few questions in Turkish, I reply, boom, I qualify as uh, I pass the test. You can see that if I had not passed even that test, I would have definitely not qualified as a Turkish speaker. But passing the test doesn't mean anything over and above the fact that you know, I have, you know, I'm on the other side of the threshold. It doesn't mean that therefore I'm proficient in speaking Turkish. So the Turing test is, doesn't show anything in terms of once it's passed, what happens to A and B. But it does show that we're not even there, we're not even stuck at the stage of being able to talk about machine intelligence if the machine doesn't pass it. So if the test is failed, forget about any conversation about uh, machine intelligence. But if the test is passed, well, we might start talking about it. Why we should not be talking about it. Well, um, as you remember, uh, uh, the, the paper by Turing was published in um, uh, 1950. Uh, Turing writes somewhere that uh, he thinks that uh, the test will be passed uh, in about 50 years. Now, I know that I've been bad-mouthing Turing, but he's one of our heroes, so you attack only great heroes. Um, it's a bit suspicious that uh, he had these 50 years in mind. Now, um, it happens when people make predictions, uh, it's because we have five fingers, uh, and we think in terms of 50 or 100. Um, so. 50 years from now uh, is 1950, so it makes it 2000. In 2000 uh, or 2023, as I told you, ChatGPT and uh, easily spottable in terms of way too good uh, for being a human, uh, there is nothing around that passes the test, as I explained to you, in terms of uh, irreversible questions. So that didn't happen. Um, Someone else, uh, Eric Schmidt, um, in uh, uh, a talk they gave at Aspen, um, uh, he said, uh, well, I, I believe that um, uh, according to some uh, engineers and computer scientists, et cetera, uh, the, test, the, the test will be uh, passed in 2018. Now, 2018 is a very precise date. Uh, it's not rounded. Unfortunately, guess when he gave that speech? I'll give you a second. In 2013. So instead of 50 years, you got five years because you have five fingers. That's how you do science um, with your fingers. Well, um, we have other dates around. Um, in this case, um, I've forgotten his name, uh, the father of the, the, of, uh, the singularity um, suggested, uh, name will come back. Uh, anyone in the chat, welcome to make suggestions. Um, uh, uh, let's see if anyone can remember him. Um, Kurzweil, thank you. Uh, 10 points for Raphael. <laughs> uh, Kurzweil, uh, it says, uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, um, uh, the Turing test will be passed in 2028. 
Now, that's another very precise date. You start thinking, oh, what did he say that? Well, this is a different case. Um, uh, he said that uh, because in 2028, he will turn 80. And so for his birthday, well, it's as good as any other because of possible speculation about how the world develops. Um, another famous, well, let's see, I'm not going to say anything this time. We'll see who comes first here uh, in the chat. Um, another famous Cambridge scientist um, uh, told us, no, the, um, the singularity, you know, Turing test, etc., will happen in 2115. Now, that's another very precise date. Uh, can anyone guess when he said that? Of course, he said that in 2015. Because um, uh, Alan Turing had no, no, five fingers, uh, but in this case, we use ten fingers. 100 years instead of 50. Now, this is how you do science uh, in Cambridge. Uh, nasty remark, of course, um, uh, from the Oxford or former Oxford person. But apart from jokes and nasty remarks, I hope you understand how ludicrous this is. These are numbers you know, that people throw around because it's 50 years from now, 100 years from now. In five years, when I'm when when I turn 80, oh, what about uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with, when the next Star Wars will come out? Uh, it's as good as any other. So at some point, I had this little challenge. Um, uh, I, I was uh, meeting Eddie Schmidt uh, more regularly because of the advisory board for Google and the right to be forgotten. Um, he never picked up the challenge. Uh, but I had a challenge uh, here that I would eat a whole plate full of aubergine if uh, the Turing test would have been passed by 2018. I didn't have to eat aubergine. I hate aubergine and I'm safe. I'm actually uh, happy to repeat the challenge. Um, I told you, you need to understand what the Turing test is in terms of irreversible questions. Do we have irreversible questions for um, uh, ChatGPT? No, because we can ask the kind of questions that ChatGPT will answer in such a way that you will know that it's ChatGPT and not a human being. So no human being could actually do that. So we moved uh, with the Turing test from uh, not good enough to way too good. So this was one of the questions we asked at the Turing test. Uh, the car could not fit in a parking space because it was too small. What was too small? I'm not a walking encyclopedia, you know. Now, of course, try that with ChatGPT, even the 3.5, um, not, the, not the, uh, the $20 a month, um, which I do not recommend, by the way. I had it for a few months. Uh, it's not worth the money. Uh, 3.5 works perfectly fine, fine, perfectly well. And above all, we want to be uh, coherent with what OpenAI uh, and Sam uh, Altman is saying, if they are really building uh, tools that are going to destroy humanity, you may as well do your bit and stop paying $20 a month to get there. Uh, but apart from the usual nasty jokes that you can now uh, expect from me, um, this, of course, doesn't work anymore with ChatGPT. I told you, you have to do uh, things in terms of testing too good to be true, so the other side. But it's still no, a matter of reversibility, reversibility. Truth is that uh, what we are facing today is this. Um, it is, it is the classic, I'm not a robot kind of moment. Um, in fact, actually, you, uh, at some point, you have to do that even with ChatGPT, which is in, in, it starts getting into a, a, a game of mirrors where no, the, 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 the software you should be testing is actually testing you for showing that you are not a robot. Why is this uh, interesting? Well. Uh, of course, you can uh, uh, click on I'm not a robot and you get good news. You're not a robot. Um, this is not so much a joke as a, as a reminder. Uh, it's a, a, an intelligently um, uh, 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 way, I hope, uh, no, an interesting way of reminding us that the AI that we have doesn't pass this test. In other words, any capture uh, is at such level that any AI at the moment isn't able to cheat and click on I'm not a robot and go inside. It's a so really strange way of using something that should be testing us in terms of not being a robot instead to test AI not being able to cheat and therefore pass the test in such a way to pretend, say, with a website that it is not a robot, it's a human being, get inside and make a mess. So these days, whenever you find you know, a test like this, a capture of any kind, remember, 
this is on the one hand is a test, uh, uh, you know, it shifts as it were the burden of who has to prove uh, what to whom, but it's also a reminder of how poor our AI is. It cannot even cheat on this. Well, that is something that uh, will come back in the future. One of the things that remember uh, we were discussing um, uh, previously was this uh, ability of the human being to uh, detach themselves from reality. We are not uh, so embedded or grounded or uh, immersed in our experience to be unable to think otherwise, things that are not the case. Dream, plan the future, remember the past, being elsewhere, generally speaking, with our minds. This detachment seems to me one of the hallmark of being human. Uh, we do that better than anyone else, even a dreaming dog cannot do that as well as we do, meaning a dog does not worry about uh, their patients. Uh, and it is this detachment that also enables us to think differently, the so-called out of the box. So um, I told you something about tier truths uh, in previous um, uh, uh, slides and, and uh, previous uh, uh, meetings. I hope you remember one uh, point that I stress. Uh, when uh, we have a, a, at least three or four, I mean, depending on how you count them, but it's certainly the, the most important uh, theory of truth uh, is uh, so-called the correspondence theory of truth. And it is the most intuitive. We think that uh, something is true, a proposition is true, even only if it corresponds to the way the world is. So Emmy is uh, in the room is true even only if Emmy is actually in the room. There's a famous discussion and of course it goes on and on in terms of uh, Tarski, uh, snow is white even only if, no, snow is white in quotation mark is true even only if snow is actually white. Now, <laughs> it is much more intelligent and challenging than it sounds, but let me remind you one point and that is linked to uh, I'm not a robot. This comes from Plato, and even Plato already had spotted some difficulties. The difficulty here was what happens with negative truths? What happens when I say that in the room I'm looking at, uh, where Amy is sitting uh, behind the desk, there is no zebra next to her. It is true. But what corresponds to that in the real world? A negative fact? So we now start talking about a world that contains not only positive facts, like, for example, there being a computer, a chair, etc., in their room, but also negative facts. And how many negative facts are around? I mean, you could start having a endless list of negative facts overpopulating their room with there is no zebra, there is no horse, there is no snake, there is no cat, there is no dog. This goes totally no insane. So um, even Plato had problems with a correspondence to the truth. The point here that I'm trying to make is the following. Um, when we talk about our way of thinking, a lot of that thinking is thinking of what is not the case and yet is quote unquote true. I might be thinking, for example, uh, about the uh, possibility of receiving the, the, uh, uh, the, the passports, uh, finally uh, fly to Bologna, plan the, the, the flight, etc., etc. That is not something that there's anything in the world corresponding to it. And yet it's my ability to be outside my current uh, circumstances, my being here now, as the you know, uh, Latin phrase says, hinc et nunc, meaning here now, completely 100% immersed in my experience and unable to get out of that. Now, a computer is exactly that. A computer, like uh, a very simple organism, is by design, by the way, not because it has to be. There is no sort of uh, uh, law in the universe that says so. But by design, is something that processes the data, etc., et is present, so to speak, uh, where it's located in terms of processing power. Um, so is an amoeba, I imagine, or a little ant, or, or a bee. Uh, I'm not sure about spiders. We have already the exception of the dog and primates. So. When you are asked here, uh, are you uh, a uh, are you a robot? You need to think outside the room. 
the uh, robot yes no outside the box you need to know who you are you need to understand why this question is being asked etc cetera, etc cetera. so this detachment is not there we saw a lot you now in terms of rhetoric in terms of discussion of the Turing test what AI is not time to turn to what AI really is so AI um, uh, as an expression started in 1956 uh, this is an actual reproduction of uh, the uh, 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 anniversary commemoration uh, that took place at that, that month to remember, uh, the, as the uh, text says there, the founding of artificial intelligence as a research discipline. I'll spend a moment here, and if you ever go to Dartmouth, it's a, a beautiful place. Um, uh, uh, one of the old uh, universities uh, in the United States um, uh, is called College uh, because it's that old, uh, so to speak. Um, we are in the summer of 1956, and four very young, <laughs> and I mean young, uh, researchers need to find some money for a workshop, literally. It's like you, me, uh, Amy, and someone else now getting together and say, well, we need a few thousand dollars to get these things going. So they write a project to get funded. Actually, luckily, it got funded. And the four, uh, the four kids are John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Nathan Rochester, and Claude Shannon. Some of these names should ring a bell, but it is an amazing, amazing group of people. It's, I don't know how to express this, but it's like having Beethoven, Mozart, and another couple of guys getting together and saying, oh, we really need to put together this you know, concert. So John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky will go on becoming professors and becoming Turing laureates. As you know, the Turing Prize is the Nobel for computer science. Um, they will uh, both end up uh, uh, in uh, uh, MIT. Nathiel, uh, uh, Nath, uh, Rochester will uh, go to IBM, will stay at IBM, and he will be the engineer, the architect of the first commercial uh, computer at I uh, IBM. Claude Shannon uh, just decided to establish information theory as the discipline that will determine the future of any communication on this planet, radio, internet, TV, you name it. Now, these four brains, <laughs> quite impressive, get together and they say, we need some money. And it was John McCarthy uh, who uh, coined the expression artificial intelligence. They needed to have a catchphrase to describe these machines that could do stuff that would require intelligence if done by a human being. So here is the, one of the fundamental phrases, but I'll, I'll give you the definition, quote unquote, of AI uh, that you find in the document um, uh, in the next slide. We want to proceed on the basis of the conjecture, which was you know, part of the uh, reason why they wanted to have this workshop, that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate. Now, the key word here is simulate. Why simulate is so crucial? And I hope the following um, uh, uh, analysis is super intuitive. Suppose you have a simulation of weather forecast it tells you exactly what the weather is going to be next week. What is the fundamental difference between the weather next week and the forecast? It's essentially imagine identical. It tells you exactly what happens, when it happens, in what way, how much rain, winds, clouds, sunshine, everything. Well, there is a major difference. Um, you will never get wet by interacting with a simulation of the weather forecast. You walk into that weather, you get wet if it rains. So there is a fundamental difference between the model and the system. Yeah? That's so sound, sounding like a, uh, something we have already heard at the beginning. The level of abstraction adopted by the four uh, gentlemen here is this conjecture, which is any feature, any aspect, any feature of learning and intelligence can be modeled to such an extent that 
it will simulate the system. Mind that there are other things that, for example, uh, within learning and, and intelligence are not uh, covered in this case. Uh, one important thing, for example, is uh, bodily uh, interaction with the world. Um, the four people here were interested in artificial intelligence as in what we then later, uh, like I described before, no, sort of the symbolic um, uh, kind and then the machine learning, the neural network, etc. They're not talking about robotics. And yet, I hope you remember, whenever someone has to illustrate AI, a robot will be there. A hand, a strange face, uh, people destroying the world or you know, uh, wheelchairing as uh, God knows when. So they're really talking about, um, for example, chess playing. Because uh, the only people, are, the only mem uh, uh, person in this group that I ever ever met was uh, John McCarthy. He was very old already when we met. And as I mentioned to you um, uh, many, many years ago, uh, John never lost faith in true AI, the one that wasn't really going to simulate, but was going to be the real thing. It's one thing to say, I'm going to simulate a glass of water, and another thing to say, I'm going to produce enough H2O to make water out of H2O. He wanted to make water out of H2O. He didn't want simply to simulate. Um, the point with John, therefore, uh, was, I remember the time, discussions in Amsterdam, that he was deeply, and you find this actually uh, online, uh, just look for John McCarthy review, Deep Blue, uh, Kasparov, etc. Um, he was deeply disappointed when Deep Blue won the, uh, the chess games against Kasparov. Why? Well, because he's, he kept saying, this is not what we started with in 1956. When the four said, uh, young guys there wanted to create something that it was intelligent and artificial. This is a mere machine that delivers what the machine is supposed to do, but it's not intelligent. And I know in these conversations uh, that we had, I said, John, you're absolutely right. What you are wrong about is that this is the future. That the future is machines that can deliver, can solve, can take care successfully of tasks, even if they have no intelligence whatsoever. So Deep Blue is the future. It's not a glitch, it's the solution for what we need to achieve. And the, the conversation never went anywhere, and he was convinced, and then uh, we lost sight, and then uh, he was no longer with us. Um, the definition that they uh, had uh, in terms of artificial intelligence problem was that of making a machine, again from the document, behaving ways that would be called intelligent if a human were so behaving. Now this is also, once again, very good. It's a counterfactual, as the you know, philosophers would say. Um, it's something like uh, of the kind of, had I been born you know, 10 years earlier, I would have met John much earlier, for example. Um, so it's a counterfactual. Uh, it says, if you have that kind of machine behaving to yourself, you would consider it intelligent if a human were behaving in the same way. Once again, we need to be careful about what we're talking. Let me give you a, a, another uh, example. Imagine you have an agent that moves uh, from the uh, from a high mountain all the way to the sea, moving around valleys, uh, bypassing uh, corners, uh, digging through uh, when it can um, uh, channels, and achieving its ultimate goal, which is to move from the mountain to the sea and end up in the sea. If you were looking at the agent from a very opaque, uh, a very uninformative level of abstraction, you wouldn't know whether that is a human being or a river. You need more information. You need to see whether, for example, it could have done otherwise. Could it choose to do that? Did it decide that that was a good idea? Did it decide that that was the right day to do that or it should have done it in a different, a different time? Could it have taken uh, lessons from what he did and do that again in a different place at a different, uh, in different circumstances? Now, if you have enough information, then you will tell, like, no, no, sorry, there was just a river. 
there is no intelligence there. But if a human being were so behaving, we would call that behavior intelligent. It doesn't mean that it is intelligent. It means that the behavior required to achieve the same kind of goal by a human would need to be intelligent. So put it differently, and without uh, being too subtle, you walk into a room and you see uh, uh, two players uh, playing chess. Can you tell whether you uh, say one is Alice, uh, the real Alice, a uh, human being, and the other one is just someone moving pieces for an agent you cannot see, you cannot tell. Can you reverse uh, by looking at the way in which they are playing and say, oh, that is a great champ champion or is a uh, piece of software? Um, of course you can't. But what you can say is anyone playing at their level, if he were human, would have to exercise intelligence. Imagine we have a video, uh, we're just monitoring, uh, we are uh, no, in a smart city and we are in a no, uh, uh, control room, we're monitoring uh, cars going around in, say, Rio de Janeiro, which is an actual example. Rio de Janeiro is one of the cities that has uh, quite an intense investment in uh, smart city. The other ones in, uh, could be Chicago, uh, Barcelona, Bologna, Amsterdam, etc. So because of, of uh, the previous beach, you know, etc., we are in Rio de Janeiro again. And we are looking at the movement of cars. Can you tell which car is uh, dr uh, driven by humans and which cars are uh, autonomous uh, vehicles? Probably not. Most of the times, 70 times, 70% uh, of the times in five minutes. But it does mean that uh, for a human to drive in that way, that human would have to exercise intelligence. The car doesn't have to, as simple as that. So what is going on here? What is going on is that uh, we need to understand the cut and paste. Uh, it was a long time ago when I introduced this uh, at the beginning of this course. Remember the cleaving power of the digital, the ability of the digital to re-ontologize or change the nature of what we deal with, or if you like, no, either build things or change the nature of what we interpret as the things we build. It's creating new systems and modifying how we model the reality of these systems. This cut and paste, uh, this reorganizing of uh, the, uh, what we have inherited from modernity is separating things that we thought were a block. I gave you the example of the territoriality of the law. For the whole span of modernity, we assume that law and uh, its territoriality were two sides of the same piece of paper. You cut one, you cut the other. The law is extended all the way to the borders of my state, country, place, region, not beyond uh, and uh, my place, uh, uh, your place, my rules, your rules, Westphalia, et cetera, et cetera. Single piece of paper, you can't cut the law side without cutting the territorial side. Well, uh, the, the digital has completely detached these two. We've got cyberspace. You can't regulate, for example, uh, Google in the United States, uh, say the right to be forgotten, uh, etc. You can only do that locally and on and on and on. Um, the AI case is one more instance of this cut and paste. It's not, however, what is presented in the rhetoric that I showed you before, a paste, a marriage, a putting together of some kind of, or perhaps even better than, biological intelligence on the one hand and an engineered artifact on the other. It's not a marriage, uh, forgive me for the oversimplification, of biology and engineering, it's a divorce. That's what I'm presenting here to you. It's a divorce between agency and intelligence. This is unprecedented, is as deep, as crucial, as full of consequences as the alternative picture we've been presented again and again for decades now in terms of marriage. Sim no, similar dramatic consequences, I think that this is a much better way of interpreting uh, AI and I will spend a few slides uh, arguing for this particular point. So let me stop here. A bit of a summary. AI 
has been presented for many, many decades now through summer and winters, the ups and downs, when there's a lot of money and a lot of hype and a lot of investment, and then the money dries up, no, the deliverables are not as good as they were promised, journalists lose interest, no, we go down and then up again. Now, of course, we are in an up uh, moment. Uh, the summer is hot for AI. There's lots of money, lots of hype. The journalists just can't take enough uh, of this. There's an interview uh, with someone somewhere uh, on a daily basis, et cetera, et cetera. During those periods, AI is presented a, as a, a way of putting together a marriage, metaphorically speaking, between intelligence and engineering of some kind. Through uh, computer science, machine learning, data science, statistical tools, we are able to implement at some point something that will be intrinsically in itself intelligent. Now, we don't have a definition of intelligence, I told you um, uh, many times. In fact, we have gazillions of different uh, ways of inter understanding intelligence, but essentially it would be something that, for example, passes the Turing test, but above all, something that we could, through interaction on a daily basis, recognize as intelligent. Remember the joke about pornography, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this kind of intelligence uh, that we are trying to uh, sell as a, as a culture, as a business, um, in terms of a marriage, has led to a lot of concerns. If you start creating something that is even remotely intelligent as a rat, a mouse, to be nice, um, well, then the escalation is what happens next. Once you break into we have some intelligence, it is much easier to imagine that that intelligence will keep growing exponentially to the point where we'll bypass and dominate humanity, etc. Et the science fiction scenario. What I've been arguing is that actually uh, the best of our understanding our current science, you know, bearing any miracle, is not that that kind of AI is impossible. Remember, it is logically possible. But logical possibility is you winning the lottery twice a day for the rest of your life, not serious, not even remotely plausible. So there is room for people like uh, Elon Musk, who recently, a few days ago, argued that AI as an existential risk doesn't have zero probability. Well, thank you so much. So does my possibility of being immortal. Trust me, human immortality is logically possible. There's nothing contradictory in assuming that you are immortal. It just doesn't happen because that's not the way the world uh, works. Physics, science, unfortunately, the miserable life in this valley of tears, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I wish that logical possibility were good enough to achieve anything. It isn't. We did all that, so I hope it's in the back uh, of your mind. So what's the alternative? The first step is to understand that maybe it's not a marriage. Maybe it is equally profoundly significant divorce. A divorce between what? Well, between the ability to solve problems or take care of tasks and the need to be intelligent in doing so in order to be successful. To put it less uh, in a less complicated way, you can do things at zero intelligence and do them well. But that's exactly what we have in front of us. I'll show you uh, a video of this uh, in a moment. Uh, this is uh, Okado, as you can probably read um, uh, on those boxes. Those are, are all robots. You can see the antennas. And this is uh, Okado's uh, warehouse. Okado is a big supermarket in the UK. I'll tell you more when I'll show you a, a tiny video. But these robots, are able, and this is the uh, premise we need to elaborate next, are able to be so successful because the world has been built around them, not the other way around. These are boxes that fish from the bottom whatever goods they need to pack to be sent to customers. They don't take things from shelves. Their warehouse is built around their abilities, not the other way around. So the two steps to understand here are 
divorce between agency and intelligence, the ability to act successfully, and the need to be intelligent in doing so, plus fundamental, the restructuring of the environment within which the agency operates so that an agency as zero intelligence is successful. You put that little robot in a nor normal supermarket and is totally disaster. You put a human being in almost any environment, and although the environment is not meant for a human being, well, it kind of uh, would survive uh, by fishing things. It would be very dangerous, not recommendable. That is the flexibility of an intelligent human being compared to a robot that needs to do things the way uh, is shaped and able to solve. I'm going to spend a few slides now uh, elaborating this particular point. Um, we will come back to this uh, enveloping uh, of the world much, much later. So keep in mind uh, these uh, few points uh, for the next uh, half an hour or so. One, often, if I would say the standard orthodox way of understanding AI is as a marriage between engineering and biology of some kind, if you like. Uh, the intelligence of, uh, say, a mouse uh, being reproduced uh, one way or another, or, or better uh, in engineering terms. The view of AI is as a, a, a branch of cognitive science, or experimental psychology, or neuroscience, etc. So the reproduction of intelligence in silico through uh, engineering uh, means. The alternative view is AI as a department that has been created by the engineering department. is a problem-solving uh, sort of activity. As long as you solve the problem, you don't care to look for intelligence or not. Generating, creating, uh, engineering intelligence is not the target. The target is solving the problem. If it does uh, what it's supposed to do on the team, I don't care, remember the joke, whether the submarine can be told to be swimming or not. An airplane does what it needs to do. It doesn't fly uh, like a bird, but it takes me from here to there, and that is problem solving. Of course, the differences between an, an airplane and a bird, a fish or a submarine are <laughs> incommensurable. It's just a different kind of way of approaching the whole discipline, etc. Now, if you look at the history of AI, uh, what I just gave you is a, an actual, not quick, um, simplified, but not incorrect reconstruction of where AI departments come from, even the robotics departments. Either they come from uh, the cognitive science area at the university, or they come from the engineering department. The engineering department, problem solving. Cognitive science, generation of some kind of intelligence one way or another. The cognitive science, generation of AI, et cetera, et cetera, uh, intelligent, is total disaster. Zero results. 70 years of investments. As of today, we don't have anything that has a milligram, an inch, a whiff of intelligence that we would recognize as such. It's always promising. It's always tomorrow. What if in 100 years, in 1,000 years? Well, for the past 70, zero results. 70 or 75 years since uh, sort of um, Alan Turing uh, paper until today of engineering AI, astounding. The results are breathtaking. That is ChatGPT, something that can produce a text of no, a few thousand words, which is as good as any average uh, undergraduate. That is impressive. And that is the way we should understand AI. At least if we are empirically sort of minded and scientifically oriented, and we don't want to not look into zombie movies. We'll come back to this because given this distinction, that's a, I said a few points to keep in mind, if it is then a divorce between agency and intelligence, then we have a few things to do here. One, explain how zero intelligence agency can be successful. It never happens, has never happened before. You drive at zero intelligence, and that's not recommendable. You park at zero intelligence, you do shopping at zero intelligence, you play chess at zero intelligence, is always a disaster. How come that AI can do that and be successful? Are we wrong in the analysis, or there is a missing bit? The missing bit, I would argue, is the transformation of the environment in such a way that that agent 
become successful in that environment. So agency, yes, amazing, yes, and the so-called enveloping of the world, so the transformation of the world into a place where that agency can exercise all its abilities at its best and win. More on this as we move on, but these are the two points to keep in mind, therefore. Uh, this, a divorce between agents and intelligence, and as a consequence, in order to make, make the agency work, the transformation of the world in a friendly world, a world that is AI friendly, that is shaped around AI, not the other way around. Final point before we move to something new, remember, when you look at the movies, the question is always, are we building androids that drive cars like us instead of us with gears and wheels, etc., or are we changing the car completely and the car is becoming a node in a network? Well, that's exactly what's happening, isn't it? So let's stop uh, wondering too much about this uh, marriage, which is not happening, and start investigating what happens when you divorce agency and intelligence. Immense success. This is just one of the many things from the past and I put it there and I keep it there since uh, I uh, no, uh, uh, started talking about these things uh, because that was uh, uh, 2017 was when we passed the threshold, 2017, 2018, uh, of human accuracy in terms of speech recognition, for example. Now, I hope that anyone will uh, agree with me that maybe the future is open, maybe you know, some crazy guy will come and create you know, this AI singular and so on, but at least as far as we are concerned, 2017, Surely those machines that did speech recognition better than even humans were unable to be described as intelligent in any possible way. And yet, from that uh, year onwards, you speak to Siri and no, the uh, results are amazing. And if anyone is old enough to have been no, around to dictate text to uh, a computer or even book a, a, a ticket online for the cinema, the uh, change was dramatic. Uh, so we do have amazing tools, they solve amazing problems, increasingly so, so the sky is the limit. Uh, there used to be a trend in the 80s and 90s uh, of books and articles that would be published in terms of what computers can do, cannot do. And then another note, it was very few, and then he re-edited that book uh, with what computers still cannot do, and then he stopped publishing that book because, of course, Every time you publish that book, and then there was someone proving like, yes, we can. Here it is, more and more and more. It has become, there's even an entry in Wikipedia, a joke. Whenever someone says computers cannot do X, someone at some point managed to make the computer do X, etc. The lesson from there, once again, we need to be smarter than the average uh, person. Normally, people complain, say, oh, you constantly moving the bar of what intelligence means. Once machines are able to do speech recognition, well, speech recognition doesn't count as intelligence anymore. This is unfair. Fix the threshold and I'll show you that my AI will be able to pass that threshold and it will have to admit that my AI is actually intelligent. That's the argument. No, really. If you understand all this in terms of divorce, what passing that threshold shows is that that is one more point where we know things can be done in two ways. By humans, if they are successful, they need to exercise intelligence. And we have just discovered another way of doing it, a zero intelligence by a machine for whatever reasons we uh, uh, can list. In this case, for example, the amount of training that is available in a context where a lot of the digital um, uh, data, a lot of the data are digital, the algorithms are even better, and some of the things that we're going to see uh, later in terms of neural networks, the shift from symbolic AI to uh, neural network uh, AI, etc. All those things manage to uh, ensure that that threshold stay there for humans, but is bypassed by uh, engineered machines that don't need to be intelligent in order to pass it. So it's almost like saying, look, we've got a lot of problems in, in front of us. And uh, as far as we know, to the best of our understanding, those problems require intelligence. And then someone comes and says, not true. All those problems can be solved by humans if they exercise intelligence or by machines as either intelligence, divorce, enveloping, et cetera, et cetera, what we're going to see in the next slides. 
That discovery, therefore, explains why it is not unfair to move the threshold. It would be unfair to say, oh, okay, no, forget about it, I was wrong. Let me put the threshold elsewhere. And then the computer, the AI, passes that threshold, is successful. Oh, no, sorry, more and more. But that's not what's happening. What is happening is that we are proving that, for example, in terms of translation, another classic, you can do that at zero intelligence. Google uh, has been doing that for uh, quite a while, impressively so. But if you are human, I'm afraid intelligence is the only road and the only way of doing it. So imagine the world of problems and tasks organized in terms of two ways of dealing with them, having access to solutions, etc. One, the human way. You need to be intelligent. Sorry, no way of doing that. Play chess. You better be a bit smart. Otherwise, you're going to lose every time. Machines, they're so lacking. They don't have to be. They don't have to be because there is enough data, enough algorithms, enough, enough computer uh, power, enough uh, of what I'm going to show you, uh, parameters, analysis, training, and transformation of the world so that all this actually works to make sure that in the right circumstances, chess will be played uh, as well as or better than any other human. Once you get this double access to problems, tasks, etc., you understand that there is no shifting of any threshold. The threshold is still there, but it's a threshold for humans, not for the machines. So let's warm up to uh, what has happened uh, and how this divorce has become a success. A long, long time ago, uh, in a different world, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, of course, a, a, a carefully retouched uh, picture. Um, we used to interact uh, with other agents of a biological kind. It was normal to have many horses around, New York, I think it is New York here, uh, London and so on, but also people were uh, totally acquainted with the animal world on a daily basis. So we shared the environment in the past with biological agents. At some point, we started uh, engineering all that, and uh, it's much more likely that you meet a car than a horse these days, uh, even where I live here in the Oxfordshire. Every now and then you hear clock, 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 and, and say, oh, wow, wow, there's a horse, let's go out, let's see a horse, because of course, no, it's not normal, what, but you see plenty of cars, unfortunately. So the shared environment presently is a engineered, um, full of artifacts, but the future is more like this, and this is a old picture. Uh, many years ago, uh, you know, visiting San Francisco, I was visiting, I can't remember the Google, Facebook over there. Um, but uh, we were at uh, Berkeley, yes. Uh, and um, these uh, little boxes on wheels were all over the place. Bash, half broken, the antenna stuck in some uh, sort of bush and so on, uh, delivering uh, things around. Um, it's it's your normal day. Uh, and there was, I remember, a, a lady with a little uh, kind of a, a bicycle with boxes uh, in the back, which was going around collecting these um, little robots, uh, replacing them with some uh, of them less uh, scratch and bash. Uh, and they were there to deliver mail or grocery and so on. So we're sharing our environment in the future with artificial agents. These artificial agents, remember, they are not stupid, they just don't play the intelligent game. They play the efficient, successful game of solving problems. You put this, play, this thing in the desert and it will be dead because those are the wheels. It can't walk. You need to put it in the right environment which has that kind of pavement, those kind of sensors, those kind of problems, etc. The robots I have, I have two little robots here at home uh, that cut the grass, they're fantastic. But I had to reshape the environment a little bit because uh, uh, with the sensors and uh, the abilities, they would get stuck here and there. So a stone here and the roses had to move a little bit and there was the pavement. At some point, the environment is sufficiently friendly. The robot works perfectly well. But of course, it's an environment that is also shaped not just for us, but also shared with artificial agents. How did we get there and how this divorce can actually uh, be so successful? These are the five steps that I want to illustrate. Uh, I know that it's getting close to uh, uh, 11 here, 12 there, and I might not be able to cover everything, but I, uh, 
today. Uh, we'll uh, reconvene uh, and start from here uh, next uh, next week. But I'd like to at least cover uh, a few bits of machine learning so that we get to chat GPT. Very quickly, um, we have moved from logic to statistics, I already told you. Um, AI used to be a branch of mathematical logic. The main uh, power, no, or horsepower, like the, the, the main um, uh, tool in our hands was the deduction, if then. In statistics, now, uh, now AI, machine learning in particular, is no longer a branch of log mathematical logic, is a branch, if you like, of statistics. What you have as a powerful tool is correlation. Those data can be shaped, cut, paste, transformed, modified, massaged to some point so that they give me a correlation between their input and their output. The input of those data, lots and lots of pictures of, cat, of a cat, give me the output of the learning of a cat. The system can learn that that is a cat and it will learn even if it had never seen the new picture of a cat. Enveloping, uh, so transforming all this into uh, uh, a world that is friendly towards uh, the machines that are interacting with that uh, world. The shift from difficult to complex, it will take some uh, bit of time, but it's quite intuitive. Anything that is difficult is really hard to be implemented by AI of any kind, but if you can transform difficult into complex, meaning a lot of computation, well, that is a piece of cake. More on this in the future. Change rules. Um, rules can be either uh, um, sort of, uh, constraining uh, or regulative. Uh, different kind of rules uh, enable different kind of AI. More on this uh, next week. And then the importance of data and the move from historical to hybrid to synthetic data. These five trends represents the future of AI, especially of AI uh, interpreted as we are doing in this course as a divorce. But I want to show you uh, just a little bit um, what is in uh, store for us. Uh, so this is um, one of the many um, uh, classifications of AI. It reminds us two things, and maybe uh, this is the only point that I, uh, that I stress, uh, we'll leave ChatGPT to, um, in the next slides to next week. I see we're running out of time. One of our colleagues, uh, Emmys and, and, and mine, uh, David Watson, uh, who is now a lecturer, uh, a senior lecturer in London, uh, King's uh, former uh, member uh, of our group, still a member of our group, uh, um, as, a, as a PhD student uh, uh, with me, uh, criticised this map, saying, look, no, it's a mess, it's all over the place. Uh, now, at the same time, um, uh, Dr. Correa, who uh, uh, allowed me to uh, reproduce it here, um, is also an expert. And of course, what you find here is different expertise uh, clashing, uh, which is perfectly fine. I'd like to uh, show it to you and spend uh, a minute or two uh, looking at this picture for uh, a couple of reasons. One, even experts can disagree on what counts and what does not uh, as AI. AI goes from, uh, look at the uh, left top, inductive logic programming and robotic uh, process automation, all the way to evolutionary uh, algorithm, genetic algorithms. Um, it can include deep learning uh, or fuzzy systems. It has computer vision as a whole branch, but also decision networks. Uh, somewhere here, I don't see them, but uh, it, we used to speak of expert systems in the past. It covers perception, reasoning, knowledge, planning, communication through things like logic base, knowledge base, probabilistic methods, machine learning, embodied intelligence, search and optimization. It used to be called symbolic, it became increasingly statistical or maybe sub-symbolic. The terminology uh, is uh, inevitably uh, up for grab. Uh, that is not a point. The point is, one, this is an, an archipelago. AI as such is not a scientific term. A scientific term is something that you can define. For example, um, proton, that is a scientific term. H2O, water, that is a scientific term. Light or speed of light, and go on. Gravity, you name it. 
evolution. These are all scientific terms, terms for which you have a complete description, necessary and sufficient conditions, and people who disagree don't know what they're talking about. Okay. Now, AI is more like an umbrella term. Remember how vaguely it was de uh, defined in uh, uh, Dartmouth in 1956? Well, we haven't moved from there. Is well, whatever you do with machines, they can do things that would require intelligence if we were to do them. Well, that's really like a bit of a sort of criterion, a finger pointing in a particular direction, but it really doesn't tell you what is included or is excluded. It's a no, uh, remarkable um, uh, piece of uh, Excel <laughs> uh, transforming to some kind of uh, uh, neural network uh, already, uh, AI or not. The point is, therefore, is one, to understand that AI is an archipelago, um, but this archipelago has undergone a fundamental transformation. And that's point number one here. Remember, we are here from logic to statistics. We move from deduction to association or correlation. This is crucial. Without this, we would have never had the success of the past five, six or seven years or so. Now, um, I told you that I want to stop here and uh, I'd rather not introduce ChatGPT because uh, it, it's good to have that chapter, so to speak, for next week. But let me tell you a couple of things about um, narrow networks in terms of history. Neural networks, machine learning, um, uh, which is uh, normally uh, now associated with uh, neural networks, have a very long uh, old history. Uh, they were developed decades ago. The funny thing is that Marvin Minsky, remember one of the four guys who launched uh, AI, was the guy who actually killed, uh, always, no, the story goes, uh, was one of the guys who actually killed a research program for a long while. He published uh, some uh, very influential uh, research showing that what were um, uh, neural networks at the time, which were incredibly simple, they were one uh, layer only um, uh, neural networks, so they could provably not do as well as symbolic AI. But that was good enough to kill for a decade. Uh, there was a huge debate, of course, etc. But uh, the very people who had launched the AI program, not Marvin Minsky and followers, were also responsible for stopping what we know is one of the most successful applications of AI, machine learning of this kind of a neural network, from developing in those years. Fast forward, and uh, that particular sort of internal fight led to, as a matter of fact, a sort of winter of the logic-based AI. Uh, it was kind of uh, reaching a point where it was clear that uh, there was a plateau of solutions. Uh, we mentioned, for example, voice recognition. Well, voice recognition wasn't really going uh, much further than uh, being kind of good, uh, sort of good. Uh, it was not yet good enough um, because no matter how much if and then uh, and just to be a little bit fancy, else <laughs> you had in your programs and, and lines of uh, uh, programming, it wasn't really able to get to where we wanted a performance that was smooth, indistinguishable from what a human would have done had a human exercised intelligence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is true that Deep, uh, uh, Deep Blue uh, won a chess, but Deep Blue is nothing compared to what uh, Deep, uh, uh, Deep Mind uh, developed much later in terms of um, algorithms that could uh, uh, play Go or any other chess, uh, sorry, uh, any, other, any other board game. Um, we started with checkers and checkers was still symbolic AI. In fact, Bertrand Russell, when checkers was uh, 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 transformed into a algorithm and uh, it was proved that uh, the software could play much better than any, any other player. It was a much, much simpler game than uh, chess, which is also simpler than Go uh, in terms of number of rules and combinations of rules. 
Well, Beth Moraz at the time said, oh my goodness, had I had that, uh, uh, it would have taken me so much less to develop all Principia Mathematica, etc., the mathematical logic behind the development of contemporary mathematical logic. Anyway, going back to no, this slide, from logical statistics, that particular road became increasingly difficult to sort of uh, um, go through. Oh, here they are, you know, these expert systems here um, and fuzzy systems, they, they really didn't perform as well as they should have, for example, like a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Then the slow movement of um, uh, narrow networks uh, uh, kept growing. And, and I remember uh, it was in the late 90s, um, uh, the impression was that this was going to happen. Two things that really made a huge difference were the amount of data available and the computational power. Because these uh, new systems are greedy at a level that is staggering. Oversimplifying to the most, Remember that silly example of recognizing the picture of a cat? Well, you need to have those thousands of pictures of a cat available. When we talk about ChatGPT being trained on you know, millions and millions and millions of texts and words, etc., well, someone has to remember that those things have to be available in the first place. When Google developed the translation, uh, the automatic translation from one language to the next, the first attempt successful was done on European legal documents because those documents had to be available on X number of languages at the European level. The same document translated into or available in Spanish, French, German, Italian, Greek, Portuguese, Swedish, etc. So it was useful to know exactly how to translate from one language to the next because you had the text there. So there was training available. There were patterns that could be exploited. Of course, once Google started having all the world's uh, uh, encyclopedia and uh, all the libraries in the world uh, available as a database, what well, translating one sentence into the next with that amount of information becomes feasible. Meanwhile, the computational power that goes into it is amazing. Now we're talking about uh, only now having enough of a uh, uh, I'll tell you more in a moment, computational power to do this. So when, for example, Elon Musk uh, produced that letter, and you know Elon Musk is the, is, is the bad guy in the story here, uh, signed that letter uh, with uh, OpenAI, et cetera, about, oh, you know, we should regulate uh, um, uh, AI, we should be more careful, it's an existential danger, you know, his tweet and so on. Well, I think it was the week later or so, but please correct me, uh, the chat is there for a uh, more precise reference. But when it was a week or two, the next thing he did was to buy 10,000 graphic cards, NVIDIA kind of graphic cards, to do the computational, to have the computational power at the hardware level to do in parallel, and that's another big step that ChatGPT and those models have compared to previous models in terms of neural networks, to do the training so that they could recognize the usual uh, language patterns. So all of a sudden you have a hardware-based computational power of staggering uh, magnitude that can work on a huge amount of uh, uh, data that are available for no, nothing with algorithms that were already present in the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden, in a matter of, I would say, two, three years, logic to statistics from deduction to association or correlation, depending on your vocabulary. That is what has made the new AI, a completely new chapter, and that's why we talk about it so much these days. We wouldn't if we had been stuck with the logic-based, sort of uh, Minsky kind, uh, uh, John McCarthy uh, kind of uh, AI that was uh, Lisp, Prolog, those kind of languages that are so close to uh, propositional logic um, uh, of the kind that you might have uh, uh, studied in a course of logic if you took one, uh, say, uh, in, uh, in computer science or uh, uh, as, a, as a philosopher. I'll stop here because uh, uh, the next points uh, uh, introduce uh, the second step, uh, which is uh, to remind you um, the enveloping. But we have much more to say uh, about how this story uh, has developed today into 
what we uh, all have um, uh, heard, if not uh, used, which is ChatGPT and similar products. But for this, we have to wait next week. I stop here. Uh, I stop the uh, sharing, and I hope there might be some questions uh, and uh, um, comments. Yes, we've got one question in the chat. Uh, in the shift from deduction to induction, from the logic to statistics, is the lack or the impossibility of abductive inference a good point to address the limitations of AI, or is it just a futile point because it assumes the goal of human-like intelligence? Ooh, let me see what the question is, because I can I can also read it myself to see better. Uh, is it in the chat? Yes, from Pasquale. Oh yeah. Um, Yes, so uh, this is someone clearly who has done some logic, and uh, thank you, uh, Pasquale, or a lot of logic. Um, so um, for those of you who haven't, uh, and you know, this is a, a multidisciplinary group, so um, when I say, for those of you who haven't, so like I said, it, it, we all have our gaps. Uh, so inevitably, there might be some computer scientists here who know this by heart, and some people coming from mass media who may not have had uh, that kind of exposure. So let me be... Um, uh, uh, let me make no assumptions. Um, if you um, open uh, page one of Introduction to Logic, and it's a good book, <laughs> and it doesn't trick you into believing that there's only one kind of logic, they should tell you that there's at least three kinds. Uh, uh, they all mentioned in this question, so thank you, Pasquale, for uh, reminding us. The, the deductive kind uh, is the one that you are definitely acquainted with, is the syllogism, is what you find in Euclid, is if then coming from axioms, or assumptions, and it tells you that uh, if A, uh, then B, uh, if B, then C, and you carry on until you prove that all that leads to whatever conclusion you want to get. It starts from uh, uh, premises, it goes through deductions, every step is necessary. If the premises are true or acceptable, uh, then if you do a correct derivation of the conclusions, the conclusions are also acceptable and must be uh, endorsed. Uh, this deduction, and I'm oversimplifying here, um, uh, has one fundamental point, which is it works amazingly well, but it doesn't expand what is in the premises. So a classic example if, is all men are mortal. You must have heard this a million times. It's a good reminder, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes, we are. Uh, all men and women, uh, just in case, <laughs> are mortal. Uh, and all human beings are mortal. Um, Socrates is a human being, therefore Socrates is mortal. A chain of inferences that leads from the premise to the conclusion, inevitably, no way you can escape the mortality of Socrates, given premise one and two. That is called deduction and uh, is one kind. The induction is a way of proceeding bottom up. It's a way of saying, look, uh, you look at Socrates and oops, he did die. Well, actually, you know, he was forced to commit suicide. Uh, you look at Giordano Bruno and he was also uh, someone who died, another philosopher. Uh, he was uh, uh, condemned and burned at the stake, which is much worse than what happened to Socrates. Then you look at Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza was rejected by his community. He died of basically hunger, uh, didn't have enough uh, to eat. And you have one, two, three, three philosophers, and you start having an induction from three cases that if you are a philosopher, you're going to end badly. Now, you're either going to end by committing suicide or being burned at a stake or dying of hunger. Uh, that induction, of course, uh, is a lot of cases leading to a general conclusion. Of course, the conclusion these days is not true. As I reminded my students, you know, the career of a philosopher is way safer. Uh, it used to be burned at the stake, but not these days. Worst scenario, you just don't get a job. Unemployed, Ooh, well, compared to what happened to Socrates, Bruno Spinoza, that's a joke, eh? yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, more seriously, imagine uh, you are in Beijing and you want to know uh, what is the color of um, hair of human beings. You start walking around, black, one black, two black, 10 people black, 100, 1,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion people, all black hair. Conclusion, well, as my induction, I check a billion people and they all have black hair. So human beings have black hair. You finally fly to Sweden <laughs> and oops, <laughs> it doesn't quite work. So induction has this problem that deduction has the problem of not 
expanding what is already in the premises. It unpacks what is in the premises, but you don't expand your knowledge. Induction is expanding your knowledge, but it does that sometimes in a very faulty way. You must have heard of the black swan kind of moment. Uh, all the swans are white, but actually not true. Uh, there are black swans, and the black swans now has become the title of a book to uh, indicate the occasional strange event that falsifies all the generality, all the generalizations that you have uh, in the past. So induction is no longer top down. It does expand your uh, uh, knowledge bottom up, but it's risky. So the best thing that you need to do when you run any inductive reasoning is to not to look for confirmation, but to look for falsification. Have I changed environment? Have I met people who speak, for example, a different language? Have I moved country when checking the color of the hair of the people I'm interacting with? If I haven't, I'm just getting the same a million times. As Wittgenstein would say, it would be like checking whether the news of the newspaper are correct or not by buying many copies of that newspaper. Guess what? <laughs> they're all printed and they're all the same. They will confirm whatever is in it. You need to buy a different newspaper. You need to check different sources. So try to falsify. If your falsification doesn't quite work, then increasingly pop and style. The more you fail in falsifying your induction, the more likely it is but just likely that you might be on the right path. You never know. Induction remains constantly open to the moment when you say, oops, it was everything but that case, which being so and so falsify my conclusion that things are such and such. Then there's the abduction. Abduction is what you normally find in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's not top down deduction, it's not bottom up induction, but is, if you like, left, right, or right, left, in the following sense. You walk into a house and uh, there is a broken window and there is a stone on the floor. You're Sherlock Holmes and you need to uh, develop some kind of conjecture, an hypothesis. The hypothesis is like, how did it happen that the window was broken? The more uh, the abduction here, the more reasonable hypothesis to make is to take this particular case and bring it under a generality that you know uh, about. That's why it's left, right, or right, left, so to speak. The specific case is that stone, uh, that window. The general case is that when stones hit uh, the glass of a window, they normally break that window and they stay there. They don't fly away. They're, they're not like birds. A bird can not break a window and then boom, a little bit like <laughs> disturb, still fly away. <laughs> Um, so you have a general understanding of the world and you subsume, uh, that's the technical word in philosophy, you bring under that general case this specific case. That's what Sherlock Holmes does all the time. Of course, Sherlock Holmes is a smart guy and he knows that if the stone is inside the house, well, that's one thing, but if it is outside the house, stones don't fly from inside to outside uh, and break the windows. If the, uh, imagine the glass is broken, but the glass, the broken glass is outside the house and the stone is inside where someone is trying to trick you. Because, of course, when you throw the stone at the window, the general understanding of the world tells you that the glasses follow the stones. They don't go in the opposite direction, etc., etc. You can see that this abduction is a way of being intelligent. You know how the world works. You understand how things happen. You are Sherlock Holmes. Now, sorry, this was uh, Pasquale, this is your fault now eh, because you ask a difficult question. So. After three minutes of big premise, um, we have no way of mechanizing abduction because it would be a way of mechanizing intelligence. We can easily, piece of cake, no, mechanize, uh, make automatic deduction. In fact, uh, uh, when I used to teach mathematical logic, we had an IBM system to run exercises. One thing that uh, I had to remind students was to uh, turn off the automatic solution, which would provide in terms of proving theorems, and try the theorems first, and then look at the solution. I don't know how many follow the advice. I guess the ones who get uh, no, top marks, as opposed to the one who failed anyway, no matter how many exercises. And induction is also something that you can uh, make automatic, but of course induction requires that testing, so it's more difficult, because how you test the hypothesis that all people around me have black hair, well, that requires imagination. 
a lot of the times when I speak to my wife, for example, uh, it was a neuroscientist, I remind you, a lot of the time that they spend in their lab is designing the experiment. The design of the experiment is how do we control all the variables and only the variables they are not artifacts, they are not random elements, and we can test then that what we have reached as a conclusion is solid knowledge, as opposed to a generalization that can be sort of uh, falsified by another experiment another time. The reason why science, we talk so much about open science these days, is because that's the only good science. Science not necessarily open as in you know, uh, providing database, yeah, but it has to be open as in constantly subject to the potential falsification of its results. It doesn't mean like some idiots uh, think, oh, therefore science is falsifiable, so it's false. No, it means it remains open to test if you like and if you want. Of course, the conclusion is that as long as you don't have a test that falsifies what we have as the best of our knowledge, that stays as the best of our knowledge. That's the scientific method. But we are, no, or rather I am uh, going uh, away from the uh, no, question here. The question is therefore, uh, yes, uh, we don't have a way of doing abductive inference properly in a sort of automatic way, because that requires the Sherlock Holmes kind of intuition and intelligence. We do have plenty of, in fact, it's, it's trivial since the 60s, literally, uh, to uh, um, mechanize, to make automatic any, deduct any deductive uh, systems. Induction uh, is a bit of a, a cooking uh, in the house sort of mechanism. You need to be sometimes really inventive to make sure that you haven't uh, um, ignore the uh, black swan. How you do that? That is a lot of imagination, meaning detachment from the world. Think otherwise. Think what if scenarios had I considered, for example, traveling to Sweden to check the color of the hair of uh, the people around me? And well, uh, if you uh, think that this was a long answer, Pasquale is responsible for it. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? I have a question. Uh, I'm uh, uh, so I'm Boris Gornov from uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, so basically, uh, in one of the lectures uh, previously, you said uh, that uh, uh, IE was bound by uh, available data and computation. So, and uh, one of the premises, of course, is that computation is is growing exponentially, but the data is, of course, not growing exponentially, probably, or maybe is it? So, could it be that the uh, Basically, the the boundaries of of the where the the boundaries are basically limited by uh, the data available to actually train it. So, um, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you a slide uh, now, uh, which uh, we will come back to. Uh, is one of the slides I will show you again uh, next week uh, when it comes to data. Um, let me see. Uh, I hope this is uh, visible. Uh, no, uh, actually, this is the wrong, uh, sorry, um, wrong screen. Um, let me show it to you in a, a moment. Um, uh, almost there, uh, bear with me. And here we are. Okay, so this is one of, one of the many pictures you can find uh, online in terms of growth of data. Whatever picture you find, two constants are crucial. One, we talk about zettabytes, immense. And the second one, which is absolutely vital, everybody concentrates on the right hand side, but the real point is on the left, at the bottom of the left. Look when this started. All the data we have, massively, by far, 99.9% .9 of the data we have today have been generated in the last couple of decades. Now, that number at the bottom here, 2005, you can push it back, back, maybe another five years, I don't mind, 2000. But everybody agrees that 2000 onwards, quarter of a century, basically living generation, uh, uh, also, um, that's the data we have. And that is the difference that has made to our way of understanding 
also artificial intelligence, not just the um, impact of digital technologies, because we live in within that green sort of um, curve. Our life is like completely immersed in such a, a sort of ocean of data that then becomes possible, for example, even for very simple elementary gadgets like my um, uh, thermostat, which is a bit intelligent, is a, is a nest. And it adapts, it's turning on and off, uh, depending on whether I'm home or not. But how does he know that I'm home, home or not? Well, because I, it's linked to my mobile phone. And my, my mobile phone is uh, geotagging my presence here and there. So it's not that it's intelligence, like the perfect butler says, oh, Professor Floyd, you're welcome home. Uh, the college will now be open and we'll turn on the, no. It's, if it went, if you went for the geotagging, if you went for the network, the internet, etc., the poor thermostat could do whatever they wanted, but it wouldn't be able to tell me, oh, Luciano is coming home. Literally, I can, quote unquote, I can see Luciano on the road, so I better turn on the thermostat. So when, when it comes home, half an hour later, the house is um, sort of, uh, welcoming. That is the world. So what you were saying, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the world of data is actually coming to any uh, limit foreseeable, that curve is going to go up and up and up because it's mostly machine generated, uh, created by machines to machines kind of interactions, most of it. And uh, in terms of computational power, that is a little bit more uh, of a bottleneck. Now we have hardware ways of keep the um, computational uh, power growing, for example, by more uh, graphic cards and uh, uh, being, me, making more uh, processes parallel. But Moore's law, anyone who has followed that, is coming to an end. Uh, Moore's law is basically how small you can make your circuits uh, to, uh, to such a way that uh, they go below what is physically possible. At some point, that is a limit. The limit is how small that sort of uh, subatomic level can become to multiply by making it smaller and smaller and smaller, doubling you know, the speed at which things happen. That has a limit, and the limit is now in, in being rich, essentially. No, but the, the, the growth of data is, of course, uh, uh, being fueled by the fact that we're bringing more and more online, so you get a combinatorial explosion of things interacting with each other. Yeah. But if you bring everything online, if you bring all the people online, and then at, at some point it will stop, right? That's you could imagine. No, I don't think so, because um, what uh, what is going to happen is that uh, uh, the, the real bottleneck for the growth of data, so the amount of data we have, uh, we could be talking about like 200 zettabytes, 300, 400. So how many zettabytes is going to be really the threshold? The threshold, the upper threshold seems to me, um, and it's already uh, a threshold today, is the amount of memory available the storage space we have. That is a finite quantity on this planet. In fact, recently, I don't know whether things have changed, but until recently, we were not producing as a planet enough um, uh, uh, storage space to make sure that all those data would reside somewhere, would be recorded somewhere. So normally I, I remind people saying, look, the same, it's the same effect of pictures on your phone. At some point you run out of memory and one more picture, some pictures have to be deleted. More music, some music have to, so there's a limit. Well, that limit, multiply that for planetary Earth sort of level, and what you get is a sense of, okay, the limit is not how much data we can generate, because the more uh, <laughs> there is, the more there's going to come, but where we put it, and that opens up, you now you find more on this in, in the Fourth Revolution book, but opens up a whole can of worms, because uh, who decides which data are going to be recorded and stored as opposed to which data are going to disappear, that is a strategy and a strategy we're not acquainted with. Last comment. A whole civilization on this planet is based on recording. Recording was, was an effort and you had to move from oral to I make an effort and I put this on a stone, on a, a clay tablet, on a piece of paper, on a papyrus, on, on something. Today is the other way around. Everything gets recorded, so to speak, but then pushes out other stuff. And then you have to decide not what to put on record, but what to delete. 
So from a, shall we say, a recording culture to a deleting culture, we're not ready. <laughs> because this happened, has happened in the last 20, 25 years. We've got millennia of refined culture of recording why, what, what is worth, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a couple of decades to learn quickly what needs to be deleted. Or oh, once it's deleted, I'm talking about not longer available ever, finished, not deleted as in, uh, no, the, I get it back in just in case. Uh, so this is a whole fascinating question, but I, uh, uh, I, I think there are more questions here. I don't know. Uh, back, back to um, uh, uh, Amy, but thank you. Thank you very much. You Maybe, do, thank you very much. As we move forward, thank you. <laughs> Yes, and uh, on that last point, I, I linked a uh, editor's letter in the uh, in the chat. Um, okay, so we had I see a hand up. We have one question in the chat before that. Uh, do you agree that technological developments, apart from being facilitators, have somehow created an uh, epistemological mayhem and uh, also have to somehow extend, undermine human dignity, jeopardize freedom, democracy, and privacy in classical terms? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, these are all problems that we have, uh, and um, the it is important to understand uh, how what, what kind of trade-off we're talking about. Um, of course, we want to focus on the problems because those are the things that we need to solve. Uh, um, but we also want to remember uh, all the things that are enabling us to live better, uh, more effectively, uh, including human dignity, including, you know, uh, trivially so, having this lecture right now. Uh, uh, this would have been a, a no-fly zone, it would have been impossible uh, when I was a, a graduate student, uh, literally impossible. Um, so uh, yes, uh, uh, technological developments have uh, made a, a mess of many things, but they have also uh, saved lives. Uh, improve um, uh, our uh, everyday uh, standards of living, uh, make things so much easier, uh, so much more affordable. Now, that is also to be kept uh, in mind. Otherwise, we have a bit of a dystopian view or technology is going from bad to worse. Normally, when I, when I meet philosophers who have a, a very negative uh, anti-technological attitude full stop, and I'm not talking about anyone here, I'm just saying, you know, the, your average sort of anti-technological, normally Heideggerian uh, philosopher, I remind them of the importance of going to the dentist now, not 100 years ago. Because 100 years ago, uh, in fact, actually, even my dad at the time, uh, uh, in the countryside uh, house where we uh, have uh, family house, etc., cetera, uh, at the uh, uh, ground floor, uh, the same guy who uh, uh, shoot horses uh, was also the guy who treated your uh, dental problems. Uh, it was uh, just extraction. Uh, you were lucky if you were offered a, a glass of wine before. Uh, that is in a living memory. No, thank you. Technology anytime. Um, so let's be careful not to pile up all the problems that we have on the shoulders of technology. Last point, there is no such thing as technology without humans behind. It's us all the time. It's ridiculous to start blaming um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, nuclear bomb or climate change or AI, whatever disaster you might have in mind and think, oh, technology has ruined my life. Uh, no, some humans behind that technology did. Uh, and that responsibility is only human. Anthropomorphizing uh, agency to such a level that uh, that agency becomes teleological with ends of its own and it has a mind of its own and it's doing things to me. Uh, that's exactly what the techno discourse would like sometimes to believe and we need to resist that. So technology generates a lot of problems. Yes. Also a lot of solutions. Yes. And for both, you can either praise or blame the humans behind. Absolutely. So that's what uh, the line of reasoning here uh, has been developed in this uh, um, uh, set of lectures. We're almost there. I don't know if there's anything, any other comment here. Looks like we've got one hand left up. I think we've got time for one more question. And um, Luciano, your screen is still shared, so you know. Um, so, Rafael, uh, would you go ahead? Hey, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for the, the seminar and the lessons. Uh, I, I think my, my point is uh, uh, right, kind of short, uh, taking the time. Uh, if you uh, could. Uh, Talk, talk a little bit about your point of uh, 
the problems uh, coming from the the, uh, the difficult task to complex tasks to be uh, 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 developed by the AI programs so that they, uh, as you said, they transform into computational tasks that can uh, it be done. Uh, could you uh, explain a little bit further or it will be have a seminar on that? And uh, my question uh, concerning that uh, subject is uh, if uh, it has some relation uh, also up with uh, the theory of complexity. And if it has, uh, what are the relations about? Uh, also, the theory of complexity is complex on itself. But uh, if you can do some uh, bridges on that uh, on right now or in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so both topics, um, the shift from um, difficult to complex when you are talking about tasks. And uh, I will try to be very precise, not just difficult in a sort of generic way or complex in a generic way. And then uh, more about complexity, the different kinds of complexity, uh, not just the computational one, uh, will be subject of uh, our next uh, sort of meetings and, and lectures. So if you can bear with me uh, more on this as we uh, go through uh, the lectures, and especially uh, at some point when we are going to be able to regain uh, the lost time for the um, lecture that was uh, cancel but rather postpone so Raphael, yes uh, two important essential topics uh, but allow me to postpone uh, any answer about those two topics because we will discuss them more precisely as we move forward uh, with the lectures so just a promise to come back to you um, important issues but shall we say uh, for for next week i think we might have uh reach uh, the uh, limit of the patience of everybody online. <laughs> uh, so unless there are any more questions, it's, it is 12.30 or so. Uh, uh, Amy, what do you think? Uh, back to you. Um, it just looked like there's one more question. Um, Let, let's take one uh, one more and then we stop there. So, okay, so um, Khalid says that if they uh, captured it correctly, so that uh, AI performs well as opposed to humans with an agency, but no intelligence because the world is designed as AI friendly. But isn't this an induction missing that in many cases we see this rather because the new AI solutions are being designed according to the environment that they will be operating in? Yeah, it's a bit of a chicken egg, uh, if you like. Um, uh, the test uh, to understand whether this uh, makes sense or not uh, is to take the AI from the context within which it operates successfully and move it in a context where the environment we know has not been built to make the success of the AI actually you know, uh, feasible. So imagine uh, a world in, in which um, uh, there's very, uh, well, say for example, very fewer data. Uh, or imagine a, a world in which uh, there are no sensors or there is no, uh, for a moment there is a, there's a glitch and the internet goes down. Um, uh, the satellite is not working today, uh, cloudy and so on. Uh, I'm talking about, no, say, driverless cars. Um, clearly, that world is all of a sudden showing that the driverless car is not uh, able to function properly in an environment that is not sufficiently supportive, uh, the network and so on. Or take, uh, and I will show you more uh, uh, in a moment. Um, uh, agriculture is another great example. There will be a couple of videos on this. Agriculture has been um, uh, automated uh, for, uh, I would say, at least a century. I mean, one way or another, you know, uh, mechanic, from mechanism of all kinds, etc. Today is uh, at the forefront of, of course, of the robotic AI revolution. So you have um, uh, machines. Um, uh, intelligent machines, so to speak, intelligence, lots of quote unquote, that can operate uh, in agriculture. And you start thinking, okay, well, there's a classic counter example. If a machine can be put in a field of strawberries and collect the strawberries, surely, well, as I will show you, you need to shape the field of strawberries so that the machine is successful. It's not the other way around. You don't build an Android that picks up strawberries as you and I would, but rather you reshape the field of strawberries so that they are all in such a way structured that the machine with those capabilities, which are extraordinary, uh, touch, collect, uh, a, you know, a clear sense you know, through uh, 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 perception, 
to understand which strawberry is mature enough or, or not. This is amazing, but you still have to have the whole area, the whole environment shaped around the machine in a way that I will show you. Final example, um, but then again, I'm anticipating uh, things that we're going to see next week. Um, ironing a shirt. We well, can do that in two ways, and I will show you both. Uh, like a robot, no, Android, ironing a shirt as I would, a table, no, uh, ironing uh, table, uh, the, the, uh, the hot uh, iron, etc. And it does and it doesn't work. So it's not impossible. I'll show you the video. It's quite amazing, but it requires a big room, no, uh, a robot as big as no, no, 1.8, and you had to put a shirt there. You had to collect the shirt. All it does is to iron the shirt, which is still amazing, but it's not the future. The future is, and I'll show you, a little box where you put the stuff in, uh, on top and it comes out iron. Well, that's the envelope around the robot. The robot can operate successfully because you build a whole environment around the envelope. Dishwashers and uh, uh, washing machines are the same. You build a whole house around the capacities of the robot inside. No one in his right mind will ever clean dishes or clothes the way in which a washing machine and a dishwasher does, uh, obviously. But you reinvent how to clean dishes in such a way that within the envelope, the robot is 100% successful. So what we are ex having as an experience, and I close here, which is important, perhaps the only important point maybe, is that as we progress, the tendency, the temptation of adapting the world nicely, gently, kindly, you know, uh, to machines rather than to us, will be relentless. The risk is to end up living inside a dishwasher. Uh, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. And next time you hear, literally, uh, and I'll give you another example uh, in the future, that, um, well, let me, let me focus with this uh, Oxford-related example. Oxford, at some point, decided to transform the car park next to the train station into something that had been completely automated. It's not exactly AI, it's just a, a small example. So what they decided was to remove any machine, coins, uh, banknote, etc. You could pay for your car park through credit card and smartphone only. That is adapting humans to technology. It was a complete failure because you live in a city full of students uh, and old people and you know, people who don't have a credit card, don't have a smartphone, or they just don't have it that day. Or, uh, and what do they do? I mean, the complaint was immense. Of course, we're back to coins and machines uh, and, and it's not normal. We now have an app. So you can also have an app that at that point gives you both sort of opportunities. I'm presenting this, this example as a bad example of the world adapting to a technological solution without thinking that humans will have to live with that solution. So next time you hear that any will come, trust me, someone will put this in probably in the chat uh, in the following days, you hear that a urban environment has been shaped around driverless buses. And that's the only way of actually make a bus at level five, completely uh, autonomous, independent, like a train without driver from A to B, Next, thing you, next time you hear that, well, you will know that essentially the city has decided to adapt the urban environment to the solution, a driverless bus, which may uh, perhaps the uh, city council save a few pennies. Uh, no, there's no driver, so uh, et cetera, et cetera, but not to the humans living in their house, in that sort of uh, environment in that uh, city. This is the danger among many others. And speaking of how technology is able to screw up our lives sometimes, well, remember, the people behind, they adopt the solution, they think it's a good solution, they forget about the humans, and luckily there's some backlash or some feedback that can rectify the problem. But I'm uh, wary of the natural tendency to transform context in such a way that they are, for the machines, machine-friendly, not for us. If that's the case, then we need to have a uh, sort of uh, intellectual uh, analysis ready and redesign. Complain, make sure that this doesn't happen. There's a good balance to strike, but it needs to be a balance. It cannot be just, a, oh, this is good for the machine, so I'm sorry, this is the only way the computer can do things. Can you please adapt to it? Which I hear on a daily basis, of course, by bureaucrats say, oh, sorry, this is the only way in which the forum can be processed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So 
back to you. Uh, Amy, I don't know if we uh, maybe stop here or what? Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for bearing with us, everyone, and uh, see you on Monday. Okay, and then I'll see you on Monday. Uh, thank you for the links, by the way, that are sort of uh, um, uh, being piled up there. Uh, there's uh, plenty of extra uh, reading that you can do. Um, unless something happens, please uh, let me remind you, um, the uh, lectures will be online only at this stage, <laughs> bureaucracy, maybe because I speak too, <laughs> too much about AI and bureaucracy being the problems, but there's a revenge somewhere uh, uh, being taken, but I'm not able to fly to Bologna. I don't have my passport. I hope to have it, and if so, I will be there. But at the moment, the lectures will be online only. Thank you. And have a good weekend, almost coming, it's Wednesday, so we still have to stretch our neck. <laughs> All crossing our fingers uh, for your passport, Luciano. And we can uh, stop the recording now. <laughs> so have a good time. Uh, I'll see you next Monday. Bye. See you Monday.